my talk is purely about ankylosing spondylitis. And this is the layout, but of course this is a case-based discussion, but I'll just quickly go over it. So we know the issue in ang spond has been discussed, whether the hip or the spine. You have seen this before, and the aim is to conserve energy, as you have understood. And of course, you have also understood the coordination which normally occurs, which is absent here. You also heard what a balanced spine is, so there's a negative uh, sagittal balance, what is a positive balance. And then you have to have the pelvic tilt less than 25 degrees and PI minus LL less than 10 degrees. And you also remember the hip surgeons use the anterior pelvic plane. We don't use the pelvic tilt, but then they have the same connotation. So in ankylosing spondylitis, when you have hip and spine deformity, it's actually what Fan called the rigid and unbalanced, or the stuck sitting, which is a majority, like Anil told you, very rarely it will be uh, stuck standing. And the, to add to the confusion, Fan says you could do either this hip first or you do the spine first. So that doesn't help us, does it? So he says either way there will be some problem, you know, you can correct the spinal deformity, convert it to rigid and balanced category from rigid and unbalanced and then do the hip or perform the hip and see what happens if it dislocates then you revise it. Then the Zeng came along because we get this in India and China and Zeng says always operate the spinal deformity first in angst spawn. The problem is he had only 28 cases, 22 he did the spine first, 6 he did the hip first and he said out of those 6, 2 dislocated. But not a single one of them was a bony ankylosis. I want to tell you that. So that is the problem with this paper. So yes, we need an integrated approach because we know the interrelationship. We also know about the pelvic incidence. We also know that the pelvic tilt can have implications on impingement and dislocation due to the malpositioned acetabular fragment. So yes, there's a need for integrated approach and this is my spine surgeon. He couldn't be here, Bhavuk Gurg, due to family reasons. So this is a case, 50-year-old male, ankylosing spondylitis, not under medical treatment. He had spinal deformity, inability to look straight up, inability to lie down, restricted movements at the hip, no family history. This is how it is. The workup, like Dr. Qureshi said, chin, brow, verti uh, vertical angle, occiput to wall distance, the cervical spine range of motion has to be documented. Limited chest expansion, take chest X-ray, pulmonary function test, get a, uh, a pulmonologist on board. Document the hip range of motion. Interestingly, it looks that the hip is flexed, but actually hip is extended because the whole pelvis is extended. So it looks to you as if the hips are flexed. It's the knees which are flexed. The hips are extended. And then you have to take the whole spine standing lateral radiograph, CT, MR if needed, and the DEXA scan. So these are the x-rays. We take whole spine x-rays. Never take any one of them without taking the whole spine x-ray because you could have a break anywhere in that stiff spine and it will cost you very dearly. So first question is hip first or the spine first? So we follow what Rosalie said in the Scoliosis Research Society in 2018, though not published as much, but there's sufficient rationale. If the hips are fused, hips first. If the hips are mobile, look at the pelvic incidence. If it's a low PI, hip first, unless nerve compression symptoms, and high PI, spine first. And why is it like that? The patients who have a high PI are those who have a good compensation at the spine. Those who have a low PI, they have no compensation at the spine. They are hip users. We have got certain maths. We can use a hip user index looking at the x-ray. They can tell you this patient is using a lot of hips. And that is a patient who is very likely to dislocate because the hips are very mobile compared to a guy whose hips are stiff, like Amar said about the angst point. So a low PI means as it is, there's very low compensation being provided by the spine. So if you go ahead and do a hip, and you are stable on the table, quite likely you'll get away with it. But if a low, with a low PI, you have nerve compression symptoms, then there's no choice. So the spine first. Now where? That, of course, is, uh, you know, the uh, maximum uh, safety uh, is important, and then you know where the, uh, where the apex is, and, you know, maximum leverage for correction. In PI, which is not very high, is at L4, and like it was said earlier, higher uh, uh, PI, the, it becomes more global, and you have to do the osteotomy a little higher. How much? Now that's an evolving concept of sagittal balance and then everything has to be taken into account. You have seen this cascade. So essentially three things have to be kept in mind and that is dependent on the increasing pelvic tilt, the cervical kyphosis and the knee flexion or the femoral obliquity angle. And they use, the spine surgeons use FPI or the 
full body integration technique. So these are the three things you look at. The C7 translation angle, the pelvic tilt correction angle, and the femoral obliquity angle. And you can use any of these software to decide the number you are going to do this. So in this particular case, the C7 translation angle was 50 degrees, femoral obliquity angle was 20 degrees, and posterior tilt correction angle was 20 degrees. So total restriction required was 90 degrees. And because there is only limited correction available with the different osteotomies, a posterior column osteotomy will give you 10 to 15 degree, pelvic subtraction of osteotomy will give you 30, and the vertebral resection will give you 60. This is how this patient was positioned, and you have to be very, very careful because you can break the spine or the hips, particularly if they are stiff, and this is the intraoperative picture, and you can, this was mentioned by Dr. Qureshi, extremely osteoporotic bone, ferrostated screws, injectable P PMMA, you will need everything. And then, of course, this is how the correction looked. Total correction, 90 degrees, 60 degrees from CR, and three for, uh, from 10 degrees each from uh, SPO at each level. So uh, again, talking about this, the literature does say that these are fraught with complications. Mean OR time can be 454 plus minus 176 minutes. Mean blood loss can be you know, 1.2 to 7.4 uh, liters, and overall complications can go to more than two thirds. So in the really bad cases, they are very formidable undertakings. So, uh, so this is the patient. This is how the hip x-rays were, but the hips were mobile, like I told you, and only one hip was symptomatic. So it's not a fused hip where we do both together. We are not fond of doing bilateral for everyone. And these are the corrected parameters. And then, uh, you, you know, this, uh, I'll not talk about the lending soft, uh, safe zone. So left hip was done. He came back after a year and a half to, because the other hip was symptomatic, and then he got the other one done. And this is how he looks. Now, a quick word about uh, another patient. Now, here, the patient has fused hip, but he went to somebody else who did one hip. But he did the right decision of doing hip first, but he did only one. So we did the other one. This is how the patient was walking. We did the other one. And uh, then he has to, um, then he has now, this is how he walks now after both his hips are done, and he is now waiting for the spine. One thing which you can prevent impingement uh, by is to have these, uh, you know, uh, the 3D models, and you can actually really rehearse the surgery to see in your deformity, if you're doing the hip first, how you can put them to avoid the, uh, the uh, impingement. Last case, 31-year-old male, ankylosing spondylitis, difficulty in walking, had a backache, came for this surgery. You know, we took an X-ray, it showed the uh, Anderson lesion. Now, you can't operate on the hips with this. He'll just break there and get neurological deficit. So although we needed to do hips first as per our protocol, we fixed it in situ like this, and we went ahead and did both the hips. Now, there's a fixed pelvic obliquity, and see how we have done more uh, horizontal cup here, more vertical here, uh, a little mo uh, uh, more antiversion here, a little less antiversion here, and reduced vertical offset here, increased vertical offset here to get the apparent length, length equalization because that's what you can achieve. On day two, he had severe pain in the back and he developed a break at the end of the junction. The patient is still 48 hours from the hip replacement and now he has got this, but the definite Definitive opinion surgery was not done for the, this, so it had to be fixed again. So this is the lesson here. Be always cognizant of the stresses you put on the hip or spine and vice versa when you are dealing with uh, these fused spines and fused hip. Of course, the EOS imaging is the big advantage. We have the first installation in India, and that really, really helps in these uh, complicated cases. So keep spine and hip both in mind, but I'll still say uh, if both hips are fused, do hips first. And if the spine, uh, if, the, uh, if the hips are mobile, look at the PI, and unless there are no neural symptoms, do a hip first if the PI is low.